Hey, James. Hey, how's it going, man? It's going good. This is the White Monkey. And uh, today we're going to have the topic of revolution. I will give the ball to James. Oh, this revolutionary technology is going to figure me. But, um, <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, what, what's your big interest in the subject of revolution? That's a good – well, some of my most favorite movies as a kid, um, I loved the Spartacus movie, um, and I loved – uh, the movie Michael Collins about the IRA revolutionary guy. I loved Braveheart. Um, it, I guess maybe because I always kind of felt like an underdog. It, it was interesting to see, to see historical like underdogs try to break free of their train their chains and kill the 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 quote-unquote bully, I guess you could say. Um, so that, I, I don't, yeah, I've always, those are probably, yeah, my three favorite movies, and um, just, yeah. What, uh, what, did, have you always had an interest in revolution? Um, well, the uh, revolution and revolt, I think it's the same same root word. And uh, revolutions come to mean more a change in systems of government and uh, supporting or guiding ideology than simple revolt. So a lot of uh, a lot of uh, revolutionary acts that might have been physically uh, more dynamic than uh, than classic revolutions uh, have been historically swept under the rug it's just the the habit of modern history to discount things that happened before uh, the current system was put in place okay well what do you think about if we started with um greece and greece and rome because they had a huge slave population you know you have you had Spartacus, and then I'm sure you had other slave revolts. You had the Spartans that had the uh, helots, right? I, I, they, they might have had a revolution at one point. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe we, I don't know if there's any Egyptian revolts that you know about. We could or Babylonian, but we could we could start with Rome and Sparta, if you'd like. Sure. Well, the uh, Egyptians. We're very concerned with revolts. Uh, you could classify Exodus as one successful revolt. The uh, uh, the archaeological record shows that the Egyptians captured entire enemy peoples and settled them in uh, in internal prison cities. Uh, where they slaved for the pharaoh. One, the current dean of urban history, who teaches the history of cities on the great courses, uh, went to a great deal of effort to describe that, you know, slavery was not possible until, you know, uh, the African was transported to North America. Uh, and that, <laughs> Don't lie to us, James. Come on, they weren't slaves in Egypt. They got paid. <laughs> he even he even points out that the reason why the Egyptian cities had gates that were locked from the outside was to protect the inhabitants, not the inmates, but the inhabitants of the city <laughs> from like accidentally wandering outside of the gates by <laughs> a hyena or something like that. And he discusses one pharaonic illustration, a color painting, which I've seen before, of women, uh, I think they're either brewing or they're making bread. And they're in a chamber, and a soldier with a shield and a 
spear is standing over them. And the historian notes that this isn't really forced labor, that this is just a very primitive form of loss prevention, actually accuse, uh, accusing the working class of ancient ease of, of uh, being more inclined to eat and drink what they make than to actually produce it unless they do it, you know, under the watchful eye of the royal soldier. <laughs> so uh, the, the uh, and I would say that the Bronze Age collapse was probably, ironically, Egypt is the only one of these seven empires that survived the Bronze Age collapse in a, in a weakened state. And the infamous sea peoples who have been much debated, they appear to have ultimately worked as mercenaries for these seven Bronze Age empires and also turned on them and attacked them. We could think of them as like modern military contractors. Uh, So that the Bronze Age collapse uh, in which light infantry that used... uh, basically Viking ships as a form of mobility, defeated chariot armies. They would actually run up into the back of the chariots and just, you know, kill the two occupants. Uh, This was, this would be similar to uh, some rice farmer with an AK-47 finding a way to, uh, you know, resist the attentions of helicopter gunships and B-52s and come out victorious. So, I would uh, I would be inclined to think that the Bronze Age collapse is probably the first broad based revolution that we've seen. And it was probably the foundation of what we would think of as uh, the, the Homeric uh, ethos, uh, it, which brings you down to Greece. OK, real quick. So just so I understand, you, you're saying this Bronze Age collapse brought about one of the first revolutions with the um the military contracting guys in the viking ships they they had a revolt against uh the chariot egyptians well yeah and all the other uh empires too they're basically all chariot empires even the uh the cretan the cretan and mycenaean were primarily seaborne but they actually moved their chariots by sea in these kits, almost like when I was a kid, you could for fifty dollars you could buy a little Willie Jeep surplus from World War II for fifty bucks packed in grease in a crate. Well, they had a system for folding up their chariots and transporting them on ships. So all seven of these empires, uh, the Mycenaean, uh, the Canossian, which would be the Cretan. Uh, the Trojan, uh, the Hittite, uh, the Egyptian, and then there were uh, there was one centered around Cyprus and Syria, and then there was uh, the Babylonian. Uh, all all seven of these empires were attacked. The Egyptians apparently fought the Sea Peoples to withdraw, and then left specific lists of how many hands and penises and ears they cut off and what nations they settled in in these interior slave cities. Um, And this appears to have been around the time of Exodus as well. Uh, So that would, and it's probably a social revolution. It would be similar to to what happened uh, in the modern era in that uh, these seven empires the rulers of these empires were obviously allied with each other against their own population. They did fight each other, but it was very similar to uh, the Age of Enlightenment during the uh, gunpowder era, in which the uh, until Napoleon came along, until the French Revolution and the advent of Napoleon, the kings of Europe pretty much had an agreement that they wouldn't let the war go too far. They didn't want the army to become a loose cannon and they didn't want to disrupt the structure of each other's nation. They were fighting for limited goals like who's going to possess the Palatinate or Alsace Lorraine, uh, who was going to have control of Hanover or whatever, uh, who was going to secede to the to the kingship in Spain, for instance. 
Uh, so you, you were seeing limited conventional warfare, in which the size of the armies was kept small. And he didn't involve the ideology uh, or religion uh, of the population because they were afraid of that. That had happened in the Thirty Years' War. And that structure was a way to get away from a revolutionary mindset, which you had during the Reformation, and make a more stable uh uh, a more stable system where the uh, the leaders of each nation had more in common with their adversary than they had with their own people. That's what the Bronze Age was like. And it, after it came crashing down, it gave birth to really a, what we could call a heroic age, which academics would call a dark age. Heroic age, ages are generally referred to by academics as dark ages. Okay. Um, now, the, this contracting class, were, were they the guys that were basically transporting the chariots of the upper class? Uh, now, they, these were, this was tribal. These were, th- there might have been some elements of that where you had mercenaries that fell out. But we we're talking about tribal mercenary activity, not something like you would see in the Renaissance where it was just money contracting. Okay. Uh, the Dardans, uh, uh, which would be related to the Dan tribe of Israel, Samson's tribe, and uh, uh, also related to uh, a a tribe from Greece that might have been the same tribe, uh, the Palestinians, which would have been related to the Philistines. These were possibly people from Crete or Cyprus. And then there were the the Sicilians. There were uh, Sicilians and Sardinians. It seems that the majority of these tribes probably came from the eastern or from the western Mediterranean, from the Italian Isles. Okay. Now, um, going to uh, Rome. Um, so they, I mean, what, what brought about slave rebellions and revolts in Rome? Like, because the conditions were already pretty horrible. What, what was the, um, straw that broke the camel's back that would cause the slaves to just say, fuck it, we're, we're, we're going to risk crucifixion. We're just going to revolt. Well, uh, the, uh, if we can go farther back to Greece, uh, where Greece ends up mimicking the Bronze Age empires, when the Hewats, which was a, a nation that was enslaved, it would be like when the Spartans conquered the Messenians and reduced them to Hewat status. It would be like the Apaches conquered the whole Navajo Nation and used them as slaves. Okay, so uh, when uh, the Helots uh, successfully rose up, the Athenians, who were the dedicated foes of the Spartans, they uh, they came in and helped the Spartans restore order. Right uh, now, once you get to uh, that, that's small scale compared to uh, uh, compared to Rome. Once you get to something like Rome, it has a vast agricultural interior where there's not a lot of military nearby. The Romans were really concerned about having their military near home uh, in the Republican period, and their main job was to be on the frontier. So it was understood that. There, there were successful provincial uprisings of conquered people, and then there were the three servile wars, one of which was led by Spartacus and some uh, Gallic bonehead. Okay. Uh, they, uh, one of them was led by uh, a Greek who was allied with some kind of prophet on Sicily. That was, uh, that was earlier on. But the uh, the thing, the straw, if you will, would have been the enslavement of warrior class people from 
the outer margins of the empire. For instance, Spartacus was a Thracian of the Spartacid clan, which is like a ruling clan, probably had experience uh, fighting as an auxiliary uh, with the Romans and somehow ends up uh, as a gladiator, uh, which was really a form of execution. Gladiators weren't supposed to survive. Modern academics try to make it sound like they would be like basketball players. That would never, you wouldn't want them to be killed. But uh, as far as I can determine, 95% of the gladiators died uh, in the arena. Now, the, uh, uh, the fact that you had these military men uh, that are being trained as gladiators and they're within walking distance of huge populations of uh the kind of men they would have ruled at home that might even have been uh, people of their own ethnic group. This gives you uh, an opportunity to actually uh, get an economic base right off the bat for your rebellion. It wouldn't just be like as if the 82nd Airborne rebelled against the whole U.S. Army and didn't have any logistical support. Uh, so it would be as if uh, the 82nd rebelled against the army and everybody that lived around Fayetteville and Lumberton, uh, you know, were kind of related to these guys and and they would have grassroots support. So that's what, uh, that's what made the Roman slave rebellions, uh, uh, so volatile. And it only occurred in a window towards the end of the Republic Republic. By the time you get to the empire, slave rebellions are no longer viable. It, is that because they become so, um, they get rid of like the ethnic units and there's no support structure for the, the rebellion? Well, there's, uh, they actually went to more ethnic units in the empire. The strike forces tended to be barbarians from the frontier and uh you know the main legionary units were primarily they did uh they did civil works uh ghosts and heroes i forget the name of the historian that wrote it it's a black book with a corinthian style helmet on the cover he starts out with a story about marines in vietnam recovering bodies taking more casualties recovering the dead men than the dead men that they were recovering. And he points out that if you look at Trajan's column, you know, about 114 AD, uh, and if you look at the siege of Jerusalem, 71, 72 AD, that the point of the spear are basically auxiliaries. If they're not barbarians, they're not Romans. They might be Thracians, uh, Greeks, Macedonians. And that the legionnaire, the guy that did almost all the fighting in the uh, Republican period, was basically reduced to your regular line infantry. And he's a siege engineer. And the guys that are cutting off heads and taking trophies tend to be barbarians. So if uh, or people from the uh, from the frontiers of civilization, which means frontier, you know, like front step, if you. Look at civilization like a cigarette. (laughs) And this guy, uh, 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 when he pointed that out, the the fact that there weren't successful servile rebellions in the imperial period, there were successful provincial rebellions in which, for for instance, the whole province would rise up like what happened in Judea. But they would be crushed. Not only did the legions come in, but these legions were being staffed by barbarians even if they were they were wearing the orica segmentata and they were dressed up like the roman soldier they were from another part of the empire for instance when uh when goths and sarmatians were captured by decius the roman empire the roman emperor in what 248 a.d he as a victory condition he made the goths give hand over their young men and these young men were not just held as hostages. They were. They were put in a legionary unit in Britain to fight against the Picts. It's this classic policing where you take, you know, you're going to take your, your 
a Puerto Rican paratrooper from New York and you're going to send him to West Virginia, you know, to take out any rednecks that get out of line there. And then if you have trouble in New Orleans, you're going to bring in Blackwater and they're going to get these guys that grew up in, in rural America and they're going to go and, you know, uh, root out the gangbangers in, in New Orleans during Katrina. Yeah, it's just classic policing. And once you got the empire, it's going to engage and, you know, using the, uh, you know, one tribe against another tribe and using all of these different tribes in the army to occasionally come back to the center of the empire and set things straight, make everybody toe the line. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, at, at, towards the end of this episode, I'll <coughs> talk to you more about if you think a possible like a uh, redneck rebellion is possible in America, <laughs> but um, uh, we could do we could we could kind of go, go through this episode historically, so we could do that towards the end. But um, uh, I think I think I already know what your answer will be, but it'll still be fun to talk about it. <laughs> um, okay, um, so yeah, that that's the ancient world. Um, then. We get to like um, the medieval world, I guess, or kind of skipping over the. Uh, there's plenty of revolts and rebellions in the medieval world. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you talked about one on one of your recent posts on your blog, and I my memory is just I cannot remember, but I googled it a while ago, but um. Do you happen to remember which one you mentioned? I, sh- I should have written this down. Whatever came up recently on my blog, I probably wrote eight months ago and scheduled it six months ago. But there are there were revolts against the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the emperor, who was a German, by various Italian city-states. And this is kind of a class revolt. Uh, this is mercantile towns, leagues of businessmen and artisans revolting against a feudal hierarchy. Uh, a, another version of this would have been the revolt of the Swiss against the Austrians and the Burgundians, which resulted in the Swiss. They were so successful with their 21 foot pikes and their halberds and their big flamberge swords of going out there and just unhorsing feudal knights and butchering them, that towards the end of the Middle Ages, they became the most sought-after military force as mercenaries. Indeed, the Pope still uses Swiss guards because 182 of these guys once saved a Pope from an army that was besieging Rome. They fought to the last man, these 182 Swiss men, against, you know, a battalion or regiment size unit and and he got away there's also uh there was a battle called rock uh it wasn't wasn't rock roy i i forget the name of the battle there was a a battle in the lowlands in holland around 1310 which kind of predicted the battle of Gressy, where the greeks dismounted their knights and used them as a phalanx while their longbowmen shot the horses of the French knights down. I'm sorry, the English did this, again, like the Greeks did against the Persians, against the French at Grassi in 1336. But in 1310, there was a battle in which a bunch of Flemish, that would have been, I think, men in Flanders in the Low Countries, successfully uh, came, marched out of their town and defeated a bunch of French knights with long spears. Uh, the Battle of Selkirk uh, in the early 1300s, again, uh, late, late 1200s, early 1300s, this is uh, uh, the Battle of Stamford Bridge, which were uh, William Wallace led the Swiss pikemen against the English knights. This is, again, it's a class revolt, and it's also an ethnic revolt where you've got guys that can just get a long pole and put a spearhead on the end of it and they're fighting what's essentially a modern tank and the uh with the use of welsh longbowmen 
uh, at the rematch at the Battle of Selkirk, William Wallace's army gets cut to pieces. And then uh, Longshanks, the King of England, ki- uh, combines the Scottish pikemen, I think they called them skiltrons, the groups of Scottish pikemen, and the Welsh longbowmen together in a military model, which hit. Uh, his son ends up taking to uh, to France and defeating the French. And for about 80 years, the English basically terrorized the French in France by using dismount knights as pikemen and then longbowmen on the Welsh model, but they're now English longbowmen, shooting down the horses of the cavalry. So the Middle Ages basically closes with the revolution of uh, peasant class men with uh, pikes and bows taking out the upper class. So by the end of the Middle Ages, the upper class is reduced to like like an officer class, and they have like their small units of uh, of heavy cavalry, but they no longer dominate the battlefield. So this is a military revolution, a class revolution, and in a lot of places it's ethnic. Uh, the uh, uh, the last battle, uh, Agincourt. I think it's 1415. Uh, that, that's the third time that all of the French knightly class was slaughtered by an English army. And that was over four generations. The third generation to be wiped out was at uh, the Battle of Nicopolis, when almost every rich French guy that could outfit himself as a knight got slaughtered fighting the Turks in Eastern Europe. So four generations of French knighthood get slaughtered, uh, you know, uh, over four generations. And the last one was uh, at Agincourt. By that time, this is the age, uh, it's about the time that Jim of Arc is a figure and the tide starts to turn against the English. And this partially had to do with the advent of artillery, which was, uh, Eventually, the artillery and gunpowder weapons would overtake the use of the longbow uh, and would make the the English less dominant on the continent. And it switched to really being a sea power. And that's a whole other revolution. Taking war to sea, uh, you know, was an innovation uh, that resulted uh, with that. So uh, if you're looking at military revolution, uh, switching from muscle power to uh, chemical powered warfare in the 1400s and 1500s was a huge one. And it has eventually resulted in successful class warfare, and what we would call ideological social revolution. Okay. Speaking of um, um, the French saint woman, um, I just forgot. I just forgot her name. Um, Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have also that um, – that British Celtic woman uh, who revolted against the Romans. Uh, Boetica and, uh, yeah, they, I think they raped her daughters and they beat her. She was the widow of a king and she staged a short-lived successful uprising. The final battle consisted of the veterans and uh, the, uh, the first two grades of legionnaires sitting on a hillside and uh, making bets on whether or not their green legionnaires would be able to defeat the the whole Breton army on their own, and they did, and uh, they were slaughtered just about to a man. Uh, you know, so that was a really disastrous revolt that played into the hands of the conqueror, of course, because it was run by a woman and it was emotional. So there was going to be no guerrilla conflict there. It well, was I just to, going to be I wanted to ask you that. Like, yeah. so... Are um, uh, revolutions and rebellions that are primarily uh, led by women, um, like Joan of Arc and the British woman, and um, this is jumping time periods, but I've heard that like the Vietnamese is a very matriarchal culture, and like the women played a major role in that too. Like, are they um, are they different than? rebellions led by uh, men or dominated by men. Is oh, yeah. there a okay. Well, they're, they're emotional. And as far as I can tell, the only actual female-led rebellion was Boudicca. So Joan of Arc was an interesting uh, 
strange character that was used by men as a figurehead to uh, incite other men to uh, to take their protective instincts and go forward in the battle against an enemy that they've lost every battle and their fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers lost every battle against. It was a way to get them motivated. Women in early gunpowder age were basically used to carry a flag. It would be okay. like ancient Romans would throw the eagle amongst the enemy. Well, uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, in the early modern period, you would get a chick with a flag and you'd send her up there, you know, so that it would incite the men to, you know, try to protect her and get deeper into the enemy. It, you know, it wasn't really female leadership. Uh, female leadership uh, – uh, at the highest level, when there's a female monarch, it does result in more war by about one third. Female led countries, for whatever reason, just go to war 30 uh, percent more often than male led countries. I think it's largely because the military class of men right underneath the female leader are kind of vying for her attention and they behave more aggressively and she has less control over them than a male monarch uh, would have over them. But the uh, other interesting r revolts in the Middle Ages include uh, uh, the War of the Poor in 1383, in which a bunch of peasants rose up. Uh, they were Protestant peasants, uh, and even Martin Luther did not support them. In fact, the, the lowly village priest that led these people to their doom referred to Martin Luther as that wine sack from Mainz. Okay. Did, uh, is, this because, the priest, is this, sorry to interrupt you, but is this the priest that you've quoted a lot on your blog? You I, I quoted him in an article, I think when I reviewed that book, The War of the Poor, at about the same time. And again, that was, that didn't fly. There were a couple of work. There was a theological rebellion against the church in Germany that seemed to have been put down by assassination uh, uh, by the church. And then there was this class rebellion that wasn't just Protestant versus Catholic. This was working class Protestant against Catholic and Lutheran. OK, uh, Luther was a rich guy that played ball with certain rich princes and he, he had a princely uh, sponsor. Uh, that is the man that put down this army of poor people uh, that were uh, they they were embracing Protestantism largely a, as a means of social reform and socialism. Well, the rich Protestants weren't going to have that. So they slaughtered him. In Europe, in England, uh, Watt Tyler was a yeoman. He was a guy that I guess would have been a sergeant, long bowman, that had fought over in France. And he was a peasant, which meant that he would have had a couple of servants. He would have had a family. He was a free man, but he did owe service to the king. Uh, he was away and a tax collector came to his homestead and raped his daughter. Okay, and this, this is what resulted in an uprising. This was in the 1300s. Yeah. Okay. And this almost resulted, he had the English monarch ready to fall, but he still remained loyal to the English monarch, made a deal with the English monarch, and uh, was assassinated. He was murdered at the parlay. So the revolt fell apart. It had been a successful revolt, and he had a priest supporting him. It was basically like a Friar Tuck character from, and I forget his name, from uh, from The Legend of Robin Hood. Probably, Robin, yeah. probably made his way into that story. Robin Hood was partially based on Harold the Wake, a Celtic uh, or Anglo-Saxon rebel against the Normans, and it was partially, I think, based on Watt Tyler. Uh, now, the uh, uh, there was uh, this was both in the 1300s and uh, in the 14 uh, in the late 1300s there was also a uh, a class revolt amongst the French lower class against the French knights because the French lower class found themselves having to fight the English knights because their knightly class failed them the mercenary 
Italians uh, employed by the king failed them. So you ended up with a warlord that was styling himself a knight that was leading a peasant army and having some success. And again, he made the mistake of having a parley with uh, actual knights and they had him assassinated. So again, that kept the Hundred Years War from turning into a class war in, uh, in France. That revolt was put down. Uh, 1300 was a huge time for class warfare on the mainland. And then in the 1400s, you have Yan Hus, who was the leader of the Hussites. They were a breakaway uh, Christian sect. And he pioneered the use of cannons and wagon loggers and had a lot of success. He would eventually be killed. I think he was actually blind at some point and still leading these these armies. Uh, and he was using cannons against knight, knights. This was very rude behavior, and he eventually paid <laughs> his life for this. Uh, but th there was the late Middle Ages. There, I mean, in, in large part, the Middle Ages come down uh, under the weight of various uh, class revolutions. And there's mixed with ethnic revolutions. The Basques, for instance, were having success against mounted French and Spanish knights as mountain infantry at this period. And they used pikes and they ran a lot. There was uh, a, uh, 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 and finally, with the Reformation and the Thirty Years' War, uh, then it actually collapses. Uh, the European order and you end up with a piece of Westphalia and there's a new, more rigid uh, national state structure uh, during the Enlightenment that is actually designed to resist these type of class revolutions and particularly ethnic re revolutions like uprisings. You had a peasant revolt in 1548 in Cornwall. It was ethnic. It was the Cornish rising up. Okay. Uh, you also had one in Northumbria. That was also ethnic. It's called the Peasant Rebellion by historians, but when you look at it, these were a mix of ethnic and religious doctrine revolts, where I think the Cornish one was not just ethnic. It was also tied into the use of a certain prayer book, which I kind of forget the details on that. But the uh, what, what you end up with once uh, 1648 rolls around and Europe wants to restructure, uh, you end up with something, uh, a national state structure that is pretty rock solid against ethnic rebellions. Like the the revolts by the Scottish and the Irish will be brutally put down in the early 1700s, very successfully. And and result in the Scottish being so enthralled to the English that they become their strike force in colonial wars uh, around around the world. And also they use them in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, but what happens with this new type of nation state is it's susceptible to ideological revolution. OK. okay. Um. Can we go back to the earlier peasant revolutions sure. um, in the medieval period? And it seemed like, if, if I remember correctly what you said, most of them failed because they tried to do treaties or negotiations with the king or knights, and then they were uh, betrayed. If they hadn't made that mistake, you know, thinking that their enemies would treat them with some level of honor – were they doomed to failure or was there any chance that they well, could have successfully won? Uh, most most of them failed because they didn't have the weight and they didn't have the expertise or the financial backing. But uh, in a couple of cases, uh, they succeeded in the short term due to a particular genius. And the ruling class knew that if you cut the head off the snake, the you know, the rest of the peasants and serfs would, it, it would just be a mess. So uh, this is, uh, this strategy was continued uh, in the new world by all nations that were involved in toppling Amerindian nations and empires. But yeah, you, 
the first thing Cortez did was capture Montezuma. The first thing Pizarro did was capture Athalupa. You know, when Maryland and Virginia were at war against the Susquehannocks and were getting their asses kicked, they called a parley and they executed the five chiefs of the Susquehanna. You know, I mean, so they knew to a tribal society, leadership is much more important than it is to a feudal society or a merchant based society. And it's and it's economically more brittle, too, you know, because of the the amount of effort uh, people at a tribal level take feeding themselves for through the winter, for instance. OK, so you're going to see that is just a go to strategy that almost every war against a tribe in North and South America was basically a hunt for the chief. You know, we just got to get that bastard <laughs> then everything will be all right. You know? Right, right. And okay. that's no different than how Alexander the Great fought his wars or how the Romans fought their civil wars. It was all about getting the other leader. OK. So. um I guess we could brief. I mean, we could briefly talk about the American Revolution, um, if if you would like. I mean, that one's been probably done so much, but it would be interesting to know your your perspective. Though I I, I think you've talked about it a lot in other podcasts, but just from the sense of revolution, yeah, I'm curious what you think about that one. Uh, well. The interesting thing about the American Revolution is it was one of about 400 acts of rebellion in English-speaking North America. It's just astounding. It actually serves as like a curtain that hides uh, all these other uh, revolts. Oh, like whiskey rebellion? Okay, so that Whiskey Rebellion was afterwards. Shays Rebellion was afterwards. Okay. Yeah, it'd be, it would be interesting to talk more about these unknown, more more grassroots kind so of there's, uh We'd have uh, one of the first one. One of the first ones was in uh, the 1580s, in which uh, there was uh, an English captain who had been in charge of exterminating people in Ireland. I think his last name began with an L. I think it was Lang. I'm not sure. Uh, he, uh, he started burning the corn of, uh, of native tribes that were effectively, had effectively submitted to uh, the deed of Sir Walter Riley. And... Uh, this ended up resulting in the uh, after Lane. The guy's name was Lane. So what after is Lane, deed, what is the deed of Sir Walter Riley? What is Sir that? Sir Walter Riley was given a deed to Virginia. Oh, okay, okay. But he had to settle it. He had to settle Virginia. And uh, this ended up resulting in the Roanoke Colony essentially being abducted by pissed off local tribes that had been attacked by Lane for not handing over enough corn or something. So that's like one of the first acts of rebellion in America is in 1587 uh, and 88 when uh, first these people fight back against Wayne, they retreat. And then after he leaves and the Roanoke colony is seated there, planted there, uh, they just they they go in and they they take poor Mr. White and his 98 uh, friends. You know, these were religious separatists. And they take them off into slavery to work in mines and work copper and gold up in uh, what's now uh, south, western South Carolina and northwestern uh, Georgia. So I think it was a Moag tribe that did this. Well, that was that was just one. And that was uh, things things were to come. And the most revolutionary period in American history was not the Revolutionary War. In a lot of ways, that wasn't even that revolutionary. Uh, and we can get to that later in terms of ideology, for instance. And uh, not the 1770s, but in the 1670s, in the same year, you had 
the uprising and revolt of the heathen, also called the Indians. Right, uh, right. In, in New England against Plymouth Colony. Now, Massachusetts Colony and Connecticut Colony came to the aid of Plymouth Colony. Plymouth Colony got their asses kicked. They had something like 80 settlements burned. Wow. Plantations, towns. Now, uh, the tribes that are revolting are outnumbered by the Indian tribes that are allied with the English. So they were doomed. This okay. is basically like uh, this is basically a suicide. This is a decision to die where your ancestors are buried rather than see the bones of your ancestors used for fertilizers for you know the, the latest uh, English planting uh, of corn. At the very same time, there is a revolt uh, in Virginia that's kind of like a three-way revolt. The first, uh, the Susquehannocks are betrayed by the English. They're mistaken for another tribe of Indians and attack. They fight back. They win. 90 warriors basically defeat 800 soldiers and 200 Indian warriors. They do lose their five chiefs. Uh, because these hundred warriors are terrorizing the entire 45,000 people of Plantation, Virginia, who had very few armed men to protect them, uh, a, a young fellow named Bacon, who is a, a junior planter, he's one of the frontiersmen, the men on the frontier, uh, that was originally two words, uh, he, he uh, gathers about him a rabble of free men who own nothing. They've finally worked their way out of servitude, but all they have is a gun. And they're used as bullies and militiamen by the planters. So a minority of the planters talk a majority of the freemen into backing them to go against the tidewater planters, the richer guys down on the coast. And they overthrow the governor. Wow. Okay. This is the first deployment of the British military in English speaking North America. A, a, an entire regiment is sent to Virginia because of this. This is a total disaster. This all happens at the same time. So the character of William Penn's plantation in Pennsylvania, which is relatively speaking a humane charter compared to the other charters, is largely an adjustment for uh, uh, to try to uh, found a plantation that's not going to commit all the sins against its own working class that Virginia and New England committed. Because there were uh, lots of runaways amongst the Indians in New England that were helping fight against the English. In fact, all of the Indians spoke English and knew the name of Mary Rowlingson and that she was the governor's, uh, she was, uh, she was, uh, uh, a close friend of the governor and her husband was a powerful man. And when they were holding her in captivity, they would even they would even pay her to to knit socks for them. I remember reading that okay. in your in your um your book. Okay, so they uh, yeah. so uh, William Penn tried to make an adjustment so that there would not be a revolt uh, in Pennsylvania and probably uh, did the best job of planting an English province in North America. Now, during his initial 15 years in the late 1600s in Pennsylvania, the governors of Massachusetts and New York were successfully overthrown and deposed by rebels. Oh, wow. Okay, so th this, it's a shit show. You know, the, uh, yeah, the English East North rebels. America was a real problem for the English crown, and which eventually makes these colonies, the, the way the English treated the tribes, and understand a lot of these tribesmen were runaway Englishmen, Irishmen, Scotchmen, uh, drove them into the camp of the French. You end up with the French and Indian War, and then you have to arm 
your frontiersmen, which they didn't want to do before. They didn't want to have their working class guys armed after Bacon's rebellion. So the uh, they even had to pass a law in New England that servants were no longer to be voted as officers because during King Philip's War in New England, uh, the train bands were allowed to elect their own officers. Well, a lot of the servants that were forced to serve in the train band, which meant trained band of men, they were Scottish POWs. Okay. From, I think Dunbar's revolt. So they would get voted in as the officer because they were the experienced soldier. And this really freaked out the, you know, the rulers of the colony. So uh, you end up with uh, a really a, a constant, st- there was the war of regulation, which was a revolt in, uh, in the Northern Carolinas uh, against, uh, against, the, uh, against the British uh, governor there. There, there was, uh, you have situations where the governor is often allied with Indian tribes against breakaway groups of Englishmen, Scotsmen, Irishmen. So this is, uh, this is very chaotic on the frontier, and it gives the French a chance to almost win. They almost won the French Indian War. It was a really a close run thing. And uh, I think it just came down to uh, really one battle. There, uh, the, the French Indian War is so expensive for the British that, one, not only did they have to arm a bunch of their working class subjects, uh, and not all, and, and weaken a lot of the tribes they used to keep their subjects penned in uh, in this battle, but they now had to start taxing these subjects to because the king was in debt over this war that was largely the fault of the people in the plantations that ran it because they treated the native tribes like shit and routinely cheated them. So that, that allowed the French to buy them off and gave the French a chance of winning. If if more of uh, the founding fathers would have been like William Penn, uh, then you might not have had the French in the war. Now, what were some of the reforms or laws that William Penn wanted to do in, in particular to make sure this stuff didn't happen? Okay, well, one was no cheating the Indians. Okay. Okay. The, the other one, the other one was, is uh, the Charter of Rights uh, gave equal rights to planters and Indians. So under the governor, who was also the proprietor, there was two privileged classes of people with the same exact political privileges, planters and Indians. If there was an argument between uh, Indian Joe and planter John, a jury of 12, six Indians and six planters would sort it out. Now, the free man had less rights than this. Oh, because he didn't own property? Right. Uh, The servant had no rights, zero. He had no rights. And, and, And how much of the, okay, so the Indians and the planters, what percentage of the population were they, and, and then what was the percentage? One percent. One percent. Okay, and then the the free man was he like five or ten? It's going to one percent is probably the lower margin. You're probably talking one to ten percent, and it depends on when. Okay, uh, there's going to be a certain point in the 1730s and 40s where it's like one percent, but in the beginning it's going to be like ten percent, twenty percent when you're first bringing people over. So the proportion of planters and Indians with rights to servants with no rights and free men with marginal rights is that's going to uh, that's going to increase as the population as the servile population increases. The uh, how eventually, does that, how does that compare? I'm just to like Athens. Or some of the uh, ancient. It's, it's similar. It's similar. It's exact, it's when you much identical. Or right. Not? When you first okay. when you first do your planting, like in Maryland, it's a very small number. It's very easy to see. It's like a third, okay. uh, a third are free, and then two thirds are unfree. That that's a really high proportion. But then the uh, the people that are in charge 
they start bringing over more servants. And then there's more planters that come over that bring over more servants. And they'll become a critical time. Like during Bacon's Rebellion, you have probably 46, 47,000 people in Virginia in uh, 1674. Uh, you've got like 200 to 250 planters. You've got a, about 1,000 freemen. You've got maybe 1,000 Indians. And then everybody else is either a woman or a children, which is technically not a free person, or they're unfree at, at some level. And the population of Africans was only 2,000 at that time. And a couple hundred of them were free. Some of them were even slave owners. Okay, so you okay. have... Well, there becomes the crucial part for revolution is not when you have this huge servant population and small planter class. It's when you also get a population of free men who do not yet own property, who do not yet have the right to vote, uh, but are free. They're free. Now, these people are going to have some ambition. They're going to hold some bitterness in their heart. They're going to have some affinity and relationship with the people that are still bound. They might have relations among them. This is very dangerous. So in Pennsylvania, they were very careful to manage to give the free man the vote. Like 10 years in, the free man had to vote in Pennsylvania. Not so. He didn't get to vote for uh, for like 50 years in Virginia. And then they took it away from him two years later. Wow. OK. And okay. this is a time when the vote actually had some power. Yeah, yeah, because you, you didn't have that. You didn't have that many people. Uh, and now once you have the French and Indian War, uh, it, you understand that the military arm of Pennsylvania is the Indians. It's the Delaware Indians. That's who the military is. They're also the slave catchers. How can you run away and head to the hills when these guys are out there? OK, and right. they bring you back and they, they get a reward. Well, there's a speech. Uh, that was recorded by Peter Williamson, uh, who was involved in the French Indian War and had been a slave in Pennsylvania and had been freed and had his own little cabin uh, in which the only chief that didn't go over to the French gave a speech to the to the governor and the, the assembly in Philadelphia in which he said, I only have 90 warriors. You have 20,000 men here that are unarmed. Well, what does that mean? They're unarmed. If they're unarmed, it means they're not free. Okay. okay. I mean, that's really why the gun rights thing in America has always been such a big deal. Because, for instance, in Virginia, there were complaints when uh, the agents of the king came over. The, uh, the subjects of the king some of whom were free, were complaining that even though they were free men, they were not allowed to have guns, but the Indians had guns. Their well, dogs were not allowed to bark at, at the Indians when they came by. You know, <laughs> uh, they had to depend on the Indians to get rid of the wolves. You, you know, so, well, that tells you that the Indians were the ally of the governor against the population. It was the same thing in Pennsylvania. Uh, but so many of these Pennsylvania merchants cheated the Indians that most of them went over to the French. So then they had to arm uh, their free men. And then they also had to arm their servants. OK, now, and a lot of these servants would be disarmed after the conflict, which caused a real spike in runaways after they were put back into servitude. Was there any resistance by the servants during that disarmament period. Uh, that well, in the form of running away, and this happens in the American Revolution. In fact, a lot of the soldiers were servants that took the place of their master in the battle line. There's wow. a record of a couple of servants in uh, a, a military detachment from Georgia. And they're in Pennsylvania. They not only desert, but they rob an officer at some <laughs> point. They become bandits. Now, if you look at the history of the Hessians, the Hessians were slave soldiers. The, they the, they the were not mercenaries in the, the, Germans, in the American Revolution. Those are the Germans in like the English Isles and then 
the British Isles, sorry, and then in America too? Is that the well, Hessians? The Hessians were from Hesse. The prince, according to the law, when a man was 18, if he was able, he was taken out of agriculture and he was put in the military for 24 years. Wow. He was not, he was not paid. He wow. was... Uh, he was then put in a unit and that unit would be rented to some great king or prince by this prince. So they were mercenaries to the English king. The, the British king was paying the prince of Hesse castle for the use of this regiment. But the only men in the regiment that were being paid were the officers and the subalterns. OK, and they would have servants. There was even an executioner. That that was in this regiment that was stationed in this regiment and it was very dangerous uh from the command and control perspective uh to let these regiments march around without cavalry accompanying them because entire units would desert even the sergeants were not free when you look at the desertion levels it usually happens during a battle and during a march and you see that the men and the sergeants are deserting as units when you look at the proportion of men and sergeants that desert. Wow. Okay. And hundreds of these Hessians actually desert the ranks and ended up staying in uh, in America at the end of the war. And the biggest number of desertions were when they were being marched back to the sea to go back to England. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, and the uh, uh, the runaway situation. As far as the uh, the men that were going to be disarmed after the end of the conflict, uh, after the French and Indian War and after the Revolutionary War, it was uneven. Sometimes it didn't happen. Sometimes the men weren't disarmed. The further south you went, the more likely they were to be disarmed. The further north you went, the more likely they were to be allowed to keep their weapon and then given a land grant. Uh the, the North had had a much worse problem with fighting the Indian tribes. So they were much more likely to reward the servant that had fought in the ranks, let him keep his gun and give him a little bit of land because he's a buffer between the savages and them. In the South, the, uh, the tribes were, uh, the tribes tended to get along with the planters more and actually work with them. Okay, so they were more likely in the south to disarm their servants and put them back in the servitude okay as if this as, as, as if being forced to serve unpaid in an army is not servitude right so, right okay um are there any other oh i would be interested in talking about if some rebellions that um were pale faces and uh the 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 negroes were actually united and fighting together against the cl upper classes i think you've mentioned that before in some of your other podcasts yes uh that was that was all across the south there, there were I, I haven't found any any accounts of african only uprisings there was uh, uh, there was co there was cooperation. If you read, uh, 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 it's not out yet. Uh, Search for an American Spartacus. Uh, I detail all these rebellions, and uh, it's about four hundred of them. And what I did is I. Uh, for each one of these uprisings, conspiracies, rebellions, and revolts, which would include an exodus, a mass exodus, a uh, whole people trying to get away, uh, I would include the racial makeup of the system owners and the racial makeup of the people that were uprising against it or trying to escape from it. And more often than not, it was mixed on both sides. Where, where you had people of multiple races, uh, tribal, African, and Caucasian uh, on the master side, and then you would have tribal, African, Caucasian on the servant side, uh, and including to include Bacon's Rebellion. 
You had Africans fighting on both sides of Bacon's Rebellion. Okay, that's it. It's kind of like the Civil War. You had Africans fighting on both sides in that yeah. one too. Yeah, Nathan uh, Bedford Forrest's personal honor guard had ten African cavalrymen, including a guy named Napoleon who was the chaplain. Uh, yeah, you know, so it, it's uh, it, it's not black and it's not black and white. So therefore, it's kind of incomprehensible to the modern American mind. But the uh, <laughs> yeah, the, a great example would be uh, uh, the fight of the Shawnee and the Miami people against exactly. the uh, American government. And this is led by uh, Blue Jacket who was, uh, uh, his name was Marmaduke Van Swearingen when he was born. Okay. Um, okay. James, do you mind if we take a quick bathroom break? Uh, not, not at all. Okay, I'm going to put on a, some Irish rebel music while the cool. audience waits for us. Okay, all right, thank you. I'm going to play um, The Rising of the Moon. Fiber freelancers wrote get rid of this here. Let's see if James is I'm back. back. I'm back. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, I just went to the bathroom, got some more shoes, and... Um, um, okay, we were... Yeah, we were talking about the mixed... Um, Nathan Bedford Forrest, and he had um, some uh, Afri some Africans on his um, personal guard. And um, were they free, or were they promised freedom after the war? He he had been a slave trader, and he ran that. He he got into that business as a bodyguard to his uncle, who was a slave trader. And these slave traders would kill each other over to property. Uh, he decided to get rich being a slave trader by being the guy that treated the slaves the best and guaranteed their good behavior. Didn't beat them, fed them good and all that. Uh, and he wanted to get respectable and get out of the slave trading. Um, he was from Tennessee. Tennessee voted not to secede from the Union, but Lincoln decided to invade Tennessee anyhow. So... Uh, they ended up fighting. Uh, Bedford probably fought in Tennessee uh, uh, for four of the years of the war. He had 52 slaves. He freed them all. And, you know, he told them they could do what they wanted. They could stay and work for him if he wanted to. I believe two of his slaves uh, quit him and they went north. Uh, the other 50 uh, worked with him with him in some paid capacity, including one old cuss who threatened a union general after the war was over because the general came too close to uh, the general's horse. King Philip was a big black horse who <laughs> hated men in blue uniforms. You know. uh, so, so yeah, uh, Forrest uh, would, had maintained a good relationship with the African-American community, had barbecues with him after the war, uh, was even acquitted of murder uh, by a mixed race jury when he killed this young fellow who was beating his wife and insisted he, it was his right uh, to beat his wife. And uh, Forrest wouldn't put up with that. Yeah, Forrest also rented, I think, 1,700 uh, Caucasian American prisoners and work them on chain gangs okay so uh you know that's not exactly the picture you're going to get from him in standard histories but that's all true uh, the uh, uh the aspect uh the, the mixed race aspect of the uh, uh american politics is in all the founding documents uh and uh the 1776 Constitution of Pennsylvania, it's even stated that this state, this country are for no particular group of people. It's for people that are willing to be denizens of the government, inhabitants of the government, 
and live according to its rules. And they even named God the governor of the universe. It was all about civic nationalism. And on the tribal side, uh, the Indians were given a choice uh, by Anthony Wayne. You can die fighting me or you can live like a white man. And a lot of these Indians were, quote, white, like Blue Jacket. And uh, that's what they were fighting for. They were literally fighting for their freedom to hunt instead of having to farm and live in a town. And uh, th this continues all the way across the United States uh, in various little dramas that are, uh, that are again, mixed race. The, the Indian Wars, was, it was a whole mixed race experience. Now, the, right after the revolution, you have Shays' Rebellion, which okay. was a, a disenchanted colonel by the name of Shea, I forget his first name, uh, that was, you know, uh, angry, uh, rightfully so, about uh, uh, some some promises that were not kept. Uh, and I don't know much about that. That is something that I really want to look into. And there is the risky the whiskey rebellion. The whiskey rebellion uh, was bloodless, other than I think we discussed this before. Other than the men that were forced into the ranks who uh, starved to death and, uh, you know, froze to death in the Appalachians, uh, you know, putting down the bloodless whiskey rebellion, which was basically a tax rebellion. You know, and that and again, they were uh, the men that deserted were retrieved or their hair were retrieved by Shawnee tribesmen. <laughs> right. It, you know, so it, it's. Uh, there's no clear racial lines that I've been able to find in the primary sources in um, American history. Um, okay. Um, do you, would you like to talk about the, the French revolution? Sure. Okay. But that, that's a topic I don't think you, I've heard you talk much about, so I'd be kind of interested in your take on that. Oh, it was in part a military revolution. Okay. Uh, it, it it wrecks the military system that uh, that was had. If, if you look at uh, you look at the unit composition in tabletop war games, for instance, from the Napoleonic period, a a core uh, before Napoleon, before the French Revolution, would have maybe ten thousand men in it. Uh, you know, in uh, in the early 1780s, all the way up until the early 1790s. By 1805, a corps might have 25,000 men in it, uh, and that's largely on the French side. The uh, uh, the very strict supply chains, uh, the very brittle lineal battle lines uh, of uh, the age of gunpowder. Warfare in which the convicted convict who was forced into the ranks and he's made to stand up as part of this giant meat shotgun and stand there and get shot at and then deliver a volley back. He's got to be more afraid of his sergeant than of the enemy. Right. That's why a sergeant is armed with an axe or a pistol. Okay. Uh, not because it's an effective military weapon against a bayonet and musket, but because it's good for whacking somebody in the back of the head uh, that doesn't want to fight. So uh, once you get the French Revolution and then you have an ideologically inspired ethnostate, France, fighting against five surrounding monarchies, against these small professional armies full of largely uh, low emotional commitment uh, soldiers. You look at the, uh, the movie uh, Barry Lyndon with Ryan O'Neill. It'll give you a good idea what it's like being a soldier in these yes, armies. That was a, that's a <laughs> good movie, yeah. Okay. So this, uh, the French are able to, because of their unit cohesion, they no longer, and the, the fact that the men are willingly fighting 
for their stake in the republic uh, that you no longer need to use your cavalry to keep your own infantry from running away. You can use them more effectively as scouts against the enemy and for pursuit against a broken enemy. And you can uh, get your men to live off the land. Now, this eventually proved disastrous for Napoleon when he invaded Russia because they ate everything going one way in and had nothing to eat on the way out. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh, but as long as you were in the, you know, continental sized garden of Western and Near Eastern Europe, you could uh, march around in circles and not have to march back the way you came and just forage off the land. Uh, so a French infantry unit of the uh, Napoleonic era would have 25% more movement, more rate of movement than a standard infantry unit. And this is the same thing that you see in the American Civil War, where they're still trying to use Napoleonic tactics. And it, it's very disastrous for the infantrymen. And it re results in the development of trench warfare. The uh, Confederate infantrymen had, again, 25% more movement than the Union infantrymen. Now, this was largely because the Union guys were taken from the cities and they were forced into the ranks. And a lot of the Confederates volunteered and they were rural guys. They were used to moving around. The, the Union troops in the West were an even match for the Confederate troops in the West. But in the East, it was rural against urban. You know, so you would still see this. So you're... Uh, you can imagine it today, if uh, infantry combat anywhere in the world, if you're taking boys from Montana and West Virginia and Utah, and you're having them fight guys from suburban Washington, D.C., who's going to win, right? You know, the guys from the city are going to have to take a rest every hundred yards. Right. Okay, so, so this uh, it, it enables you to the ideology uh, of the French Revolution, which I'm not interested in discussing, uh, that because uh, any ideology will do, right? That will <laughs> enable you to harness the natural quality of the working guy, which in France was largely a farmer. You know, he's a guy that, you know, uh, farmers are a whole lot stronger uh, than urban guys, okay? They have a lot more stamina, uh, you know, and they're better fed. That's a, another big part of it. You know, not only is uh, the guy from the city uh, in the early modern era, not only is he not as physically acclimated to toil, but he's starved and relatively diseased. So we, you've got like your typical gunpowder army. He's got guys that are scraped off the street, taken out of taverns, taken out of prisons and forced into all the same size shoes, okay, fighting against French infantry who aren't even wearing shoes because they're barefoot peasants to begin with. Uh, you know, it's a really one-sided fight. Okay. You know, so, so after that, after the French Revolution, really every nation, even the monarchs, wanted that ideological base you know, for their for their soldiery, because now they're that, you know, they they could see what could be done. Everybody's worshiping at the tomb of Austerlitz uh, all the way up until 1864. You know, and then even after that, they're still trying to fight like Napoleon going into World War One. OK, so they were worshiping at his tomb, his great victory at Austerlitz, where he beats three nations in one battle. You know, they're all. Uh, they're all looking to replicate that for the next hundred years until they run into the mud pit of World War One, and then that starts another revolution with the you know the communist revolution, and then you could also say the fascist revolution that is all caused by World War One. So well, there's a lot of uh, interplay with military revolution and ideology and religion. You know they feed off of each other because it gives you different levels of motivation for your fighting man. Right. Right. Um, what are your thoughts 
on the Russian Revolution? <laughs> it's really interesting when you look at it's like a five sided conflict. You know, every time I read about it, I'm still rooting for the white Russian Cossacks out there and, uh, Me too. you know, Astrakhan and Lake Bacow, you know. <laughs> but it's, uh, well, real it, was quick, inter- you, it, it was obviously an international conspiracy that primarily victimized the people of Russia and the other 20 or so uh, ethno states uh, in this big experiment. And I, I really think that the end result of the Russian Soviet revolution was to make the uh, was to make the capitalist uh, revolution in America succeed at the at the geopolitical global level. I just think it was what was required to keep revolution from happening inside of something like the United States, to have that scary external, you know, hyper-socialistic, dysfunctional enemy that you actually have to feed for 30 years so you can maintain them as a threat against your own people. So I think the importance of the Soviet Union is largely it facilitated the supremacy of the United States. Right. Right. Um, I don't see it as any more than a straw man for the United States, uh, which is really the 400 pound gorilla uh, for the for the Plutarchy. You know, I am. I 100 percent agree. Um, I wanted to go to a a specific character. In the on the white Russian side, Uh, have you heard of the Mad Baron Roman von Ergen Sternberg? Yeah, but I don't know anything about him. Okay, okay. You might find him interesting. Um, After the show, I'll send you some information about him. Okay. Um, I think he's just... He he, um, commanded uh, some white Russians and defeated some of the communists and then went all the way to to, uh, Mongolia and uh the mongol leaders like said he was like um like a god incarnate or something the war god incarnate okay i read about this guy i just didn't put it i just didn't put his name together oh okay okay yeah Yeah. well yeah and there was all there's also the british american invasion of russia at the end of world war one was interesting and then there was this group of what i think they were like czechoslovakians or something that ended up stuck all the way in siberia they had to find some way to get back to their home. A lot of crazy stuff happened in that war. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, so uh, one revolution that we shouldn't neglect because it's the highest body count. Okay. The Taiping Rebellion in China. Okay. You know, which saw the uh, 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 Chinese Gordon was so named for his leadership of the ever victorious army which was like a gunboat army that consisted of British adventurers and former Confederate soldiers and officers. Okay. Wow. Uh, <laughs> right. And there's something like 15 million people got killed in that. And th- there was, uh, that was religious. There were religious overtones. It's a byproduct of the opium wars. It was this bizarre Christian cult. Where this guy thought he was like the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And he was fighting against the uh, the British opium, uh, you know, supply, uh, and the fact that essentially the Brits were running China through drugs and ruining it as well, you know. So I think it's taken until their recent importation of fentanyl through Mexico to finally avenge themselves upon the Western world for the opium wars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, are okay. Oh, this is the next one. Um, do you think? <laughs> um, do you think it, there could be a successful um, hillbilly <laughs> like? 
uh, revolt or revolution. In, no. Uh, no. Yeah. I no, didn't. There's no chance of any type of successful revolution in the Western world. In fact, it's hot. It's entire construct. OK. Beginning with 1648, they continually retold it to be proof against revolution. And this calls for lateral solidarity where the upper class of each nation values each other more than their own people. OK, so, uh, the, yeah, that's 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 either fantasy or it is implanted by uh, agents of the power structure who want examples of of revolutionary malcontents that they can they can step on and hold up as an internal threat. You know, an empire has to have an external threat and internal division in order to maintain itself. And this is quite the dance that you have to do. Maintaining a credible external threat, like Dr. Evil and the Ruski Menace, whatever it is, okay, <laughs> the, the bad eating chai com disease spreaders, whatever it is. You need a credible external threat and you need a divisive uh, internal antagonist for for every side. Okay, so that's uh, and you have a pretty much 40 percent of America hates 40 percent of America. OK, and 20 percent of America is just criminal. So all three of these elements of the American population, they all serve the system of control. Because the, the criminals always serve the system of control. They, they give the system a reason to continually strengthen itself with the support of the other 80 percent who are non-criminals. And in the non-criminals, they're split 50-50. There's like a 1 percent difference between who will vote for this guy and who will vote for that guy. Uh, so you have uh, you have built in you know, antagonism to keep your uh, your electorate split. And then you have your embedded criminal population. The more a criminal population can be expanded, uh, the more the power structure can afford to let one of the political factions become unbalanced and and overrule the other one. They've been pretty careful that, you know, the uh, the ideology of the left and the right in America it's so schizophrenic, it doesn't make sense. It's been managed that way so that half the country will hate the other half the country. But if you could make the country almost 50 percent criminal, then you wouldn't need to do that. Then you could just have like a 10 percent minority, you know, politically. OK, and then your criminals will keep your political majority in line. You know, so the, the next part of the delicate dance is managing that. I think 20 million uh, Africans would help the cause. You know, I hope to see that happen in my lifetime. Uh, maybe transplanting the entire population of Haiti to Texas could straighten that situation out. I recommend giving a gallon jug of rum and a machete to every Haitian that comes across the border. <laughs> Wait, machete revolution or rebellion? Yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, but when you have the type of system uh, that is in place now that in recorded history, we haven't seen it. The Romans could only dream of something like this. Uh, then any rebellion, it serves the system because it frightens the, it makes the, the mass of the body politic quiver like a virgin woman in a football locker room, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so all it could do, uh, revolts and uprisings and conspiracies, all they can do is strengthen uh, the current uh, media tyranny, shadow tyranny, whatever, whatever you want to call it. It's many things. So it it's so multifaceted. It's hard to hang a label on it and seem sincere even. Okay. Going down that rabbit hole a little bit, um, in 
in some of the people that I listen to on YouTube, um, like um, this guy named Gonzalo Lira, coach, he's like a Coach Red Pill guy, and then James Lindsay, and on and on, these different people, there seem to be some people that want to say, it's not a conspiracy. It's not planned. It's like, I don't know. They, maybe they, um, maybe they think of it like sometimes like random mutation or something. It's all, it's all random or something or like, you know, well, and then there's other people that want to say that there's a, um, there, that there is a, a conspiracy going on, a, a planned conspiracy. Um, I'm, I'm personally of the, ilk or the belief that there is a planned conspiracy though i do think there's internal fighting i don't think everyone is like all the bad guys are are allies to one another so i think there's internal fighting going on and maybe different factions take up the mantle of the conspiracy but um i i I definitely think it's it's planned i don't think it's like random but what what are your thoughts? Oh, on conspiracy, the the best example that the American mind is beyond all hope is 90% of Americans will immediately shut their ears off when something is labeled a conspiracy. Right. Despite the fact that every weekend they watch ongoing conspiracies between coaches of ball teams. Okay. Uh Every time I work a corner for a yeah. fighter, I'm involved in the conspiracy against the team of the other fighter. Uh, anybody that plays Monopoly, anybody that plays cards, anybody that plays dominoes is involved in conspiracies. A conspiracy uh, is nothing more than spades. Playing spades or hearts are conspiracies. Uh, playing cards is a conspiracy. A conspiracy is nothing more than two or more people cooperating for their mutual benefit and or the detriment of one or more other parties. That's it. And uh, we have been brainwashed into believe that a conspiracy is a cabal of masterminds blueprinting every step of the way, okay, like a football play against zombies. Okay, they they aren't going to have any defense, right? That the uh, and the the thing is, once you achieve social control, uh, everything is a conspiracy. Uh, of course, while you're trying to wrest social control, that's it. Every election is doing conspiracies, but once you've achieved social control, uh, all you have to do is monitor conspiracies and co-opt any successful conspiracy. Uh, if you think of who, what, whatever uh, parties of people, I, I'm inclined to think that there's a couple of different, uh, you know, creep state entities that share in the control of, let's say, USG. Okay. And, and don't absolutely agree with each other on things. So they'll occasionally, you know, work at cross purposes. Uh, but they, uh, they're uh, all always working against the well being of their victims, their subjects, the shadow, uh, which would be us. Now, these people, uh, since they're in the driver's seat, if you think about this, it, uh, there's a lot of things, crazy things that are going on with uh, industrial facilities just blowing up, candy factories, uh, a fishing ship loaded with Freon on fire for a week, uh, recycling factory, it's going to be on fire for a week. Lots of stuff that could be industrial espionage, could be just accidents. Uh, whether this is on purpose or not, okay, whether buildings get blown up because the creep state wants it blown up or because they just let somebody that wanted to blow it up, blow it up or because they (laughs) blew it up. Okay. It doesn't matter. Right. right? So if you imagine who's ever in charge of the ship of state or we could, we could liken it to an automobile. What happens if four of us are driving in an automobile, any of the four of us could wreck that automobile. 
okay, the person best positioned to wreck the automobile would be the guy sitting behind the driver. They could like reach around and fish hook his eyes, stab him in the neck, cut his throat with a razor, whatever. Okay. The next best person positioned, uh, by the way, the driver's on the left and the guy behind him is on the left. The next best position to, uh, to ruin the driver's efforts to keep the car on the road is the passenger in the, in the front seat. The back right seat, that guy is in the worst position to try to wreck the car, okay? If you want to use this as a political metaphor. Now, let's say something happens from the outside. Uh, there's a tornado. Uh, there's a car coming. Uh, you get sideswiped. All of a sudden, you're driving through a rainstorm. Who's in the best position to save everybody? It's the driver because he's got his feet near the pedals. He's got his hands on the wheel. So as long as you're in charge of the collective effort of the vehicle, of the political vehicle, then any disaster will favor you. I mean, I was a store manager, okay, for four years. I, I, I just nightmare job. I'm the general manager, 110 people. I got 80 of them or 70 of them are total slackers. Uh, 30 or 40 of them are thieves. Okay. When things are running smoothly, I know another shoe is going to drop. I know that the seafood manager is going to run a pallet of fish out the back door. I know that a, a cashier up front, you know, is going to get raped by the security guy in the bathroom or some... All, you know, the the 70 slackers are all going to have plenty of time to see Mr. Jimmy coming around in his shirt and tie and figure out once I pass them what they're going to steal, what they're not going to do. It, you know, it, it's this is the way it's going to go. But ironically, I got that job because I was visiting the store manager who was a friend of mine. We used to work together. And when I went out there to visit does the store had just got hit by a bolt of lightning. Oh, wow. It fried all the compressors. All the refrigeration went down. And I walked down. I was like, what can I do? Well, nobody knew how to salvage the perishable stuff. They didn't know any of the protocols. Well, that's what I did. So I just took over. Uh, they didn't even pay me for this. I didn't ask for it. I was like, wow, you know, my friend could be out of a job if they lose all this perishable stuff because it's an independent. It's not part of a chain. So I spent 10 hours there that day and I managed the salvage operation. And then they offered me a job managing the store, being does his co-manager, being the, gen the operations guy, because he was a front end guy. Well, I found out after I straightened stuff out, which was like pulling teeth, I'm nominally in charge. I'm the commissar in this concentration camp. <laughs> OK. But, and I'm always dealing with these conspiracies. And the idiots above me and the schemers below me and the slackers all around me. But when something bad would happen, when there was a blizzard. Right. I, I had full control. OK. When I had a night crew sat on their hands and said, you know what? We don't think you're paying us enough. We didn't do any work last night. So you're going to pay us to come in here tonight and put this freight up. I was like, no, wrong. You're all fired. Except for you, John. OK, I let him out the door, I let these five Negroes out the door. And John looks at me. He's like, you expect me to put up half that freight? I said, I only expect you to put up your freight. I'm going to put up all their freight. And you're going to tell the next night crew about it. OK, I gained full control in a disaster. OK, when there's a blizzard, I gained full control. And we had like our best profit ever. Most of the staff couldn't make it. I didn't have to worry about these creeps. OK, only my good people made it in about 10 people, you know, so if you're in charge, at meaning you understand the strengths and weaknesses of the system, you understand the input and the output and a wrench gets thrown into it and everybody's got a certain level of investment in the system. Even the guy that's just trying to steal your crab meat while he's wearing an apron and a name tag. OK, then you get more control. You develop more control. You learn even more about the system. You get more of a chance to shine. More people depend on you. More people believe in you. So if you're part of one of these government agencies, you're praying for the next disaster. Right.
if you're involved in any type of think tank planning, you're praying for the next disaster so you can come up with a genius solution. And then maybe your cousin who's about ready to graduate gets a job, you know, uh, on the ground for this new agency that gets formed around your big idea. OK, so any disaster, whether it's caused by the government, benefits the government so long as it does not destroy the government. So that's it. You know, as long as it's not a meteor. You know, that takes out everything. OK, then it strengthens the government. OK, it, it's really got the government is this self-aware thing. And it's going multinational as a self-aware entity, and it's got this niche and look at things, you know, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. OK, so this thing's got a heroic idea about itself. And its subjects do not have a heroic idea about themselves. The, 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 the highest their sense of heroism rises is victimized, is victimization and victimhood. Okay. Right. So so this is, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is where we are. And I think we are beyond the uh, revolutionary phase. Uh, I think we're fully managed now and we're past the age of revolutions. Uh, and hopefully settling into a time of devolution and it'll eventually break it apart and some natural disaster will assist. Yeah. Do you think there'll be a balkanization? Uh, well, there is. But again, that balkanization actually serves the information based system of control. It wouldn't serve a railroad based infantry army system of control, but it serves an information based system of control. It serves a system of mental and emotional control. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I don't think the government's in any danger. Uh, I think. The <laughs> right. You know, guys, uh, I, I'm I'm voting for your job security. Yeah, it's right. Gonna make, it's going to make more. Uh, my next science fiction novel is going to be titled Nil. N I H L. And there's going to be characters like uh, Inspector Nil, okay, <laughs> okay, Investigator Nil, Suspect Nil, okay, Liquidator Nil, okay. It's going to be fun. And I think, you know, this uh, mm. this system uh, that you guys have developed have uh, enabled me to uh, play it being Philip K. Dick. So thank you. Okay. Right. And I'm looking forward to having dinner with which. Whichever one of you poor guys is assigned to interview me when I get back east in three weeks. So uh, take, take care out there. Okay. <laughs> yes. um, did you ever like um, manufacture or uh, or kind of scare people with the possible idea of a disaster, an external disaster as a manager to like unite them and get them. Did, did you ever play the puppet master a little bit? <laughs> uh, it was one of my great failings as a manager. Management was very stressful for me. I hate trying to control and manipulate people. Okay. So I got it. It crushed my health. OK, I've been basically. You know, I've been really sick every winter since then, since I started that job and um, the um, I'm cursed with the lack of acting ability. Me too. You know, I can I can pretend to not be feeling anything. OK, I'm, I'm really good at uh, at that. But like to pretend to feel something, it's just not something I could do, you know. Um, but that so I would try to use information, which is the wrong way to go. I would say, look, you know, there's a Walmart two miles up the road, you know. If you guys insist on upping our operating costs, then we're going to have to cut jobs. And then one guy will say, well, that's great. You ought to fire that, that guy right there. I don't like him. You know, or the other guy would say, well, you know what? I'll just go work for Walmart. You know, I, I mean, so so it, using like information and, and, it, and that store went out of business. Yeah. Okay? I was hired to keep it from going out of business. All I did was postpone it. And so even though there's a very real existential threat, I'm in a town 
where 14 chains have gone out of business in that locality, uh, in that just in the two county area. Uh, and still, I couldn't point to the very visible, you know, gorilla in the room. Look, you know, we might all not have a job next year if we can't make this fly. That couldn't even uh, get them, you know, get people motivated to just try to do their assigned job uh, for the agreed upon compensation. So, uh, you know. Yeah. It, right. Going back to you said you, used, you tried to use information. Sometimes like information. Yeah. It just people aren't motivated by it. It's like it, emotion. They'll just, they'll just twist it to their own purposes. Right. Uh, I mean, that's it. You know, people have their agenda. They'll twist whatever information you give them uh, to just justify whatever action they've already decided to do. Anyhow, uh, you know. I, I just provide information for people who are curious as a writer. That's all I do. I'm not interested in trying to form anybody that's not already curious about the subject. Right. What if um, let's say you had never gotten married? Uh, what would you have what? Uh, would you have chosen a different profession than working in the grocery store than becoming a manager? Uh, if I would have got married, I probably wouldn't have lived to be 21. I wanted to go, uh, I wanted to commit suicide in Central America well, when I met the woman that I married. I didn't even want to live. I hated the world. The world hated me. Uh, my, uh, my plan was actually to make enough, when I first got a job in a supermarket, my plan was to make enough money to get to Brownsville. And then cross the border and try to walk to Terra del Fugo and just hoping that I would run afoul of some criminal Latino on the way and, uh, you know, get shot or stabbed to death while I tried to stab them to death. You know, I mean, that 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 was like where my mind was when I was uh, 18 years old and I got that job September, uh, like about the first of September in a Baltimore City supermarket uh, around 1980. You wanted to like. I didn't want to live. I, yeah. to I, I was past better. wanting to actually kill myself, but okay. I didn't want to live. I didn't want to live in uh, this in this godforsaken planet of the apes, uh, you know, where you had constantly sort through all these lies and everybody was telling you. Um, so, uh, you know, I just wanted to have a little bit of adventure and die of violent death at the end of a short violent life that was that was my goal and then uh you know uh, this, this, this you woman's ever... i wasn't good enough you know i mean i uh i could have never been a professional fighter uh i could have been a losing local fighter maybe you know one one decision for every six knockouts i suffered uh but i couldn't even get a boxing coach that would back me uh, as a fighter, but I just didn't have the physical goods, and that was an ambition I had when I was an earlier teen. But by the time I was an older teen, I knew that I didn't have the capacity to be a professional athlete. Um, and the um, what I want a good one, and I just uh, want you know, until I got seduced by this woman who saw me as a hardworking guy that she could seduce to support her and her son. Uh, I was like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just going to go into South America, hopefully get involved in some revolutionary movement, fighting against some government troops somewhere. And I know that's not going to end well. That shouldn't last too long. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that was like, you know, I, I mean, what? I, I was reading copies of Soldier of Fortune magazine, trying to figure out what was the worst shithole in C Central America I could go to. <laughs> you know, I was trying to get to El Salvador. I was <laughs> shot in El Salvador, you know. I, so, I, but then, you know, I ended up uh, getting seduced by this woman, and I'm like, oh, I guess this is better than dying in a ditch in El Salvador. So, uh, and you know, her her kid's a nice kid, and you know, uh, needs an eye operation, and so. You know, I got a job, I got insurance, and I could get the eye operation. And then, you know, then I end up with a family, and I'm not going to abandon that. So I got to postpone 
being a loser until I'm 18. You know, uh, okay. you know, well, until they're 18, which means now I'm going to be, you know, now I'm going to be 40. Well, and then we have a kid when I'm 30. I was like, OK, well, now I'm going to be 50 before I can, you know, shrug off these uh, dreary economic responsibilities. So I end up being 50 when I decide to become a full time writer and uh, and I just do enough part-time grocery work to rent a room while I write. And, and then I couldn't do that anymore because I couldn't defend myself against uh, the hyena dons. Uh, so then I became a full-time writer, which meant I had to be a hobo, which turned out to be better for the writing. You know? so, so there you are. I, I haven't really, uh, I, I did, I wrote a novel titled Time Jacker, which does postulate alternative futures for like the young me, it was, I was asked a question similar to this, you know, Mesquite and Franklin said, James, uh, you predicted like 14 things that nobody else predicted. And, you know, uh, and you say stuff that like I laugh at and then it comes true two years down the road. You know, what if somebody came to you while you're stocking groceries when I met you, which was the late 1990s, right? And said, Hey, you're, we know you're about to write these books and send them to Powell and Press, and this is going to result in you making a bunch of crackpot predictions that come true. And we're going to ask you not to do this. If you do this, it's going to result in you being a hobo and dying of pneumonia in the woods in the Pacific Northwest, you know, in winter 2023, something like that, which almost happened. I'm like, I've been <laughs> coughing up, I've been coughing up peanut butter for six weeks now. Sure. You know, so, uh, so I did. I, I played with three different versions of me and I made it a time travel thing where I was offered a chance to become a time traveler and warned not to make any predictions about the future. OK. Uh, and I was like, I, you know, get out of here, you know, um, and I continue working in it. You know, so so I played with that. I was, uh, you know, I had no ambition to make money. I mean, so I probably would have. If I wouldn't have got married, uh, I would. I was a mark. I was making money. I was single. So some chick would have gotten me in this sack. OK, and that's I'm a pretty simple guy. If a girl's going to have sex with me and smile at me when I come through the door, I'm going to give her my paycheck. Right. And I'm going to go back to work. You know, so uh, I probably, if I hadn't gotten married, I probably just would continue working in the supermarket business and either gotten married or had a common law wife or, you know, uh, I would have continued to like be a loser uh, in that fashion uh, until I was driven to write. My only real ambition was to live in a little row house and you know, read a bunch of books that I was collecting the whole time I was working, you know, which I read as many as I could. But I always bought more books than I could read. So if I made it out the other end and retired, I wanted to have a bunch of stuff to read. Yeah. So I don't think that uh, there was like any interesting alternative future for me. I never had a desire to travel. Travel is an accident of me being a loser grocer in Baltimore and also writing about it. Well, let me ask you this extremely like unrealistic question, but I'm just let's say you have all the wisdom and knowledge you have now, but you get to go back. What would you have just decided to be like um, single from the beginning and just go straight into writing if you don't have like, you know what I mean? The, you have your old old man wisdom, but you're back in your young man body. Oh, oh, OK. Uh, at what age would I go back? What age would I be? Let's let's say let's say 18. 18. When I moved to Baltimore, if I knew what I knew now. Or 16. Whenever you became a. Um, oh, you you took the GED when you were. Uh, no, I never took a GED. I was too proud for that. I'm completely uneducated. I failed in ninth grade three times. Oh, okay. okay. Your son took so, a GED though. So I. Uh, yeah, so uh, my my oldest son, yeah, took a GED. Okay. My youngest son uh, is. Uh, college graduate and makes a ton of money. Now, the if I knew what I knew and I went back, uh, 
to Baltimore when I was 18, okay, when my friend Rick drove me down to Baltimore and dropped me off. Uh, I would move down. I, I would immediately get away. I lived with my sister and my mother for a little while, for like six weeks. Then I moved in with these losers that I worked with. Uh, I, I would get into that quicker. I'd get into that scene quicker. And then I would knock up a bunch of black bitches. And I'd have a bunch <laughs> of mixed race babies. Okay. <laughs> I would have been smart enough not to impregnate any, any any potential Karens, okay? But yeah, bro, I'd uh, yeah, I'd have a I'd have a uh, I'd have a bunch of uh, high functioning uh, mulatto uh, sons, okay? Right. Not saying yeah. it's wrong, but why, why would you do that? What's your well because the uh, the, the black chicks would not try to marry me. OK, and they would want me to stay in their son's life. OK, in a limited capacity. And that would be perfect. OK, so that way I wouldn't be in the dock for the money. OK, I'd show up to sort things out like, you know, beat up her uh, her current boyfriend if he got out of line, you know, that kind of thing. You know, uh, so I'd be a, I made a great ex-husband and I think I would have made a great uh, baby's daddy, you know. Uh, okay. so I think my target would have been like nine, nine sons. So I probably would have knocked up like 15 black chicks and, okay. uh, and then, uh, you know, that way I would have a network of, uh, uh of people, you know, and, you, uh, guys you, that respected come, me. And, you yeah. don't think they would come at you for the child support or you would no, gen generally they don't because they're guaranteed to get, uh, you know, now, I would work that. I know plenty of guys that the chicks never came after them for child support because they provided other services. Okay? okay. The government is there with all kinds of goodies for them, including jobs. Okay. So, so yeah, I, the white chick would have definitely come after me for child support. So I wouldn't have gone there. Okay. okay? I, I would have knocked up black chicks. Okay. And then with my goal for, you know, by the time I was 40 and I had like, you know, 10 daughters and nine sons, you know, by black women that I would then hopefully like uh, marry a retired Latina stripper. Okay? <laughs> and then like have like a real family. You know. OK, um, now just curious. With a giant jelly ass wife and yeah. Why not go straight? Uh, why not go straight for the Latinas when you're 18? Oh, because it's too much competition with the guys, particularly okay. in Baltimore at that time. At that time, uh, I mean, my friend Gabriel got in a couple of fights, including a knife fight over chicks with other Latino guys. Latino guys are real protective with your women, with their women against anybody. OK, uh, now black dudes actually like it when you have relations with their black women because it's it's affirming to them they feel like they're not as lowly on the social scale you're basically validating their their choice in women i mean i've been in bars and had black guys like all for me their women like yeah i mean you, yeah you you all should hook up you should what to get what's the matter you racist jesus you racist <laughs> you, you, okay so I I watch this YouTube channel called like the White Underbelly of America, and it, you might find it interesting. They do a lot of interviews of all sorts of people, like crackheads and stuff. But they've done like three or four interviews of um, uh, like these nigger pimps. Oh, and, okay, I've seen a couple of them. My uh, uh, my webmaster, I, I meet him when I'm in uh, when I'm in California, and he showed me some of those videos. It, it's really yeah. fascinating. Like you learn a lot about like female nature and stuff. But th like this one guy, he the the interview guy asked him the pimp, um, what's like the history of pimping or something, and he's like, well, it goes back to like the slave times when like the slave master he could have access to his um, black slaves, and then after the Civil War. 
um, and they were quote unquote free, um, the black men started pimping out their um, their women to the white men to make money and stuff like that. Like I sure, I'm, my yeah. my I know service guys that served in Panama and the guys that sold monkey meat on a corner, monkey meat on a stick, you you paid them three dollars, you could spend the night with their wife. Oh my wow. Yeah, while they're selling monkey meat to the other GIs on the corner, you know. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I, the the Crow Indians did it too. The Crow Indians uh let their women prostitute themselves uh, in return for intelligence and technology. They got guns out of it. Uh, they got metal out of it. They got intelligence out of it. Uh, so that would be at the fort of the muscle shell. They were actually allies. Now, sometimes this didn't go well. There was uh, a couple of battles uh, where the warriors did not appreciate their women uh, selling their services to fur trappers and whatnot. But uh, sometimes it was okay because it was a way to get military intelligence. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, you know, and the other thing is, is the uh, uh, you know for robberies in like a city like Baltimore, you get your girlfriend uh, working as a secretary to the boss. Well, then get her blowing him. Get some fat married white guy and get your girlfriend in there as a secretary and then talk her into blowing this dude at his desk. Well, now you got blackmail. Okay. And now you got an in. And plus, you know, when the bank pickups are going to be made and everything. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's, it, I had people try to work these scams on me when I had a majority African staff. You know, and, wow. and they're, the women are constantly trying to seduce me. Yeah. Wow. So, so it was, uh, you know, this one cashier, Ashley, used to put her, uh, she was built like a figure eight. <laughs> she was white, but uh, she had African features and she would put her, she would put her finger on her chin. She had a dimpled chin. She was really pretty. She was big. I mean, she only had like a 24 inch waist, but she had like 60 inch hips, you know, I mean, wow. uh, and she, she'd stand there and wiggle and she'd look at me and, and she'd sing this song, Who My Baby Daddy, Who My Baby Daddy, and point at me. You know, <laughs> yeah, I would go through all this. It, you know, so yeah, so knowing what I know, uh, they just want a lighter skinned baby. So if I was 18 and I went back in time, I'd be, I'd be knock, knocking up black chicks uh, in Baltimore, you know. Nice. Now, you, I, somewhere either I read this or you were talking to Lynn about it. You knew a guy who went to the Philippines and like, like kind of like had his own little plantation. Yeah. Like he like. Yeah. Am I and I've, I've known I've known a half dozen Filipinos too. Yeah. Okay, okay, but I thought it was like a white guy that like yeah. went to the Philippines and he yeah he worked for oil company. Okay. He hated he hated Saudi Arabia with a passion. Um, but yeah, he liked to. Uh, he bought a plantation in the Philippines. He played chess with dad on the porch. The sons worked in the uh, on the plantation. Uh, uh, mom cooked for him, and the daughter kept his bed. You know, right, right. You know, so this is a very ancient tribal thing, and uh, you know, it's. Uh, yeah. It's, no, let it's me ask a you normal this. human, normal uh, human social interaction. Okay, like I, I definitely can. It's not a judgment. I can definitely relate to being, you know, attracted to all race races of women and stuff like that. But if you had never, um, would you feel regret if you never, if you never had a white son, an Aryan son? Would you? Now it's yeah that that's passing on the genetics. I'm just curious. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I really I really don't know. That's a that's a wood question. It's hard for me to answer because I have had one. I mean I've got two. Right. Uh, right. I've got more in common with my adopted son than my birth son. So uh, so I can't really answer that because you know it didn't bother me when I believed that I was never going to have 
a son from my seed until I was 30. And that never really bothered me because I knew what a hard time I had. Uh, I, I was too selfish to be an anti-natalist. OK, you know, uh, and I didn't have so like the urge to leave sons and daughters behind. That's come upon me as a grandfather. OK, like if I made uh, incognito, he asked me, it's like, James, you could make a lot of money. If you give me the word, you know, I could like make it my main business trust. I know how to make money for you. Get your stuff out there. He's like, what would you do if you made six figures? I said, dude, I'd, I'd, I'd be knocking up Latino and Asian checks. And it, would just, <laughs> it would be a disaster. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you know, it would. Yeah, uh, it would probably be a nightmare. Uh, you know, so uh, so I uh, when I say I'd go back and knock up a bunch of uh, black women, it's because as an older man, I understand how great it is to have sons and grandchildren. Right. And I would more of that as a young man. I didn't understand that. You know, uh, so again, it would be unfair. I'd be going back, you know, going back into the st- stupid zone with high intelligence and, and experience. You know, so so that's why I say that. And I said to black chicks because they would be the willing to do that. OK. And then when I settled down to have a family, it, it definitely wouldn't be some it, it definitely wouldn't be Miss Karen. You know, it would be a, it would be a savage Latina, you know, who would. uh you know, who wouldn't mind blowing her figure up a little bit to have a few kids, you know. Right. Okay, James, I would let's if I'm still willing to do the next topic, but um we should probably end it and then start it over because we got two hours. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We so I we could um I'll end it with the 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 ending music. We could take like a five minute bathroom break and then I can call you. Yeah, I think we're good on the the revolution, uh, right. uh, time travel, uh, you know, uh, illegitimate uh, father subject. Yeah, yeah, I think it was a good transition, actually. Right. <laughs> so, are you still down? To, do you still have time today to do another topic, or do you need a? Would you like well, to schedule? Well, I have to. I don't. I only have twenty minutes before the three bears come lumbering through the door. Okay. Okay. And then there's going to be cranking up electric guitars, uh, throwing book bags, uh, teenagers cussing at each other, you know. Uh, so, uh, so no I think we should uh, probably uh, just schedule another podcast for the next subject. Okay. Um, how about um, what about Monday? Yeah, I could do Monday. Okay, Monday at the same time. Sure, sure. Yeah, that would uh, that would be great. And we did revolution. You wanted to do genocide, right? Yeah, that would be great. Just, that's a good takeoff from revolution because uh, revolutions uh, seem to be a happy place for for genocide. So. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. Let me find our our music here. Um, da, 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 da. no, it's not, <laughs> not down it. Where? Uh, sorry, I'm disorganized here. Um, this time we'll just end it without music. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. It's Take care, you, James. It's a pleasure. Well, right. Look forward to seeing what you name it. All right. Okay. Take care, bro. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye bye.